event. Um, you know, we always start off by saying that we're very grateful to be here, very grateful to be having um, an excellent conversation today with our friends over at Canon. They're going to be talking about a, a wide variety of their products. Um, you know, Canon supports the entire industry, large and small. Um, you know, there's there's no cinematographer, photographer, filmmaker that uh, doesn't use their products in one way, shape or form. Um, so we're just, you know, excited to hear what, um, you know, their presentation and, and all the things that the Canon family has to offer. Um, a quick background on us. We're dynamic. If you're getting our, our YouTube channel or our Facebook channel, uh, we just do sub rentals. Uh, we rent to other rental companies and we are, you know, the, the backbone of the inventory for a lot of rental companies that you see globally. So we've got an office here in Burbank where Brandon and I are located. Brandon and I are socially distant today. He's upstairs and I'm downstairs. Um, and then we've got uh, our Atlanta office and our UK office uh, that, that service uh, their local markets. But, um, you know, our, our expertise is, is really on that global side and shipping and providing uh, customers exactly what they need uh, to provide the, the opportunity to bid on shows, try different products and um, get their hands on things that they otherwise couldn't. So um, we're very excited to be having this conversation. My name is Austin Rios. I'm the president of Dynamic Rentals. I'm joined here by our team with Brandon Zachary, our CEO, Tom Smith, our head of sales, Sean Sims, the difficult question asker, our chief technology officer, um, Coda Aranda, our senior tech out of Atlanta, and Anna who makes this presentation and everything uh, that happens here uh, possible. So we're very excited and with that. I'd love to hand it over to Michael um, who can introduce the Canon team. Thank you, Austin. And welcome to everyone. And thank you for tuning in today. Um, my name is Michael Bravin and I'm the director of Canon Burbank which is our community outreach uh, testing and experience center in Burbank, which obviously has been shuttered since um, the middle of March. Um, and early on, we moved um, a lot of our educational and training program uh, online to Zoom and some Teams meetings. So um, that's how we're gonna continue things until we open our facility in Burbank. But for those of you that are LA based or in the LA area, after um, we go back to the office, I invite you to come and visit. We have a, we have a showroom with most of our products. We have a lecture hall that we do a, a couple programs a week in the evening. We have a 4K screening room and we have an edit suite. And we have several people who know our products and can help you answer questions and get a chance for you to put your hands on. But today, um, we're happy to bring together several of our product experts to do a run through of our, our newest product offerings. And so um, I'll introduce them. Um, we have uh, Paul Hawkshurst, who's our, one of our pro market specialists from the East Coast, and he'll be talking today about the C300 and the C500, our two newest cameras. And then Ryan Snyder, who's our pro market specialist, uh, who's in the Philadelphia area, and he will be talking today about our 25 to 250 Cine Servo Zoom. Uh, Charles LeBlanc, who's our senior trainer in Burbank, and he'll be talking today about our Sumere Cine Crimes. And uh, batting cleanup today is uh, Nate McFarland, who's a quality engineer specialist uh, on the East Coast. And he'll be talking today about our 4K HDR displays. Uh, and I urge you to uh, ask questions along the way. Uh, we have a, a period of time at the end of today's presentation where we'll be um, taking questions. But if you have questions as the gentlemen are presenting today, please feel free to ask those questions. And then at the end of the presentation, um, I'll put up a slide that has uh, several links and we'll make that available to the attendees uh, where you can look at demo material for the cameras and the lenses um, in, on your own. So we're not streaming it here through Zoom. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand it over to Paul Hawkshurst. All right, thanks, Michael. Hi everybody, my name is Paul Hawkshurst. I'm out of New York City. Uh, representing Canon in the cinema world, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about two cameras 
the C500 and the C300 Mark III. Now, the C300 Mark III, of course, is the one that we made the big announcement with the virtual press conference. It's going to be the newest camera um, coming out from the Cinema EOS line. But we're kind of combined the two. And as I jump into my PowerPoint here, I'm going to show you kind of why. You'll, you'll see why we're combining the two together. Um, the C500 is already out. It will start shipping back in January. Um, lots of good feedback on it. People have been using it. People have been loving it. So. Um, so yeah, this is kind of just more or less an introduction to the C300 Mark III as it is a look at these two cameras and how they live in the ecosystem together. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint. Voila. Does everybody see that? Okay. Beautiful. All right. So yeah, so I'm doing. We you know we didn't even put the the names of the cameras on this title screen, but as you can see there, this is a very very modular camera. So I'm going to start off with just showing you kind of the basic tenets of both of these cameras. All right, so the C500 Mark II, C300 Mark III. As you'll see as I read on this list, that there's going to be uh, a lot of similarities. But on the C500 Mark II, the first thing to know is that it's a full frame camera. It's a full frame 5.9K uh, sensor. C300 Mark III kind of retains that Super 35 uh, 4K sensor that we've had previously in, in the rest of the line. However, <clears throat> there's something very special about the sensor. It's called the, the dual gain output sensor. All right, and I'll jump in more into that in a little bit. Uh, frame rate wise, on the C500 Mark II, you're gonna get 5.9K up to 60 frames a second. You can do 4K up to 60 and 2K up to 120. Whereas on the C300 Mark III, we're doing 4K at 120p or 2K when you go into a crop mode up to 180p. So this is definitely the fastest uh, in terms of frame rates that we've had in Cinema EOS. Um, both cameras have similar dynamic ranges, about 15, pushing about 15 plus stops, a total dynamic range on the C500. But it's that dual gain output sensor that allows us to push over 16 stops of dynamic range on the C300. Um, so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that in a second. Both cameras will shoot Cinema Raw Light and XFAVC, and both of those are recorded internally. To uh, There's two CF Express card slots, and that's how we'll be able to do the light internally, the Cinema Raw Light internally, as well as both cameras have SD card slots for proxies. Um, the modular design, it's funny to see that same thing is pretty much posted down for the rest of the list because on the outside, these two cameras are exactly the same, all right? Um, same weight, same size, same buttons. Yeah, the differences are skin deep. Um, both of them have user interchangeable lens mounts, which was kind of the first thing. The C500 Mark II was the first time in Canon land that we've actually had user interchangeable lens mounts uh, without going through a really kind of convoluted process uh, with the Canon factory. So, so both of those cameras share that. The dual pixel autofocus that's really kind of been celebrated from Canon um, has really reached its apotheosis with these cameras and especially the C300 Mark III. Um, both of them have electronic image stabilization um, and I'll talk a little bit about that but it's, it's, we're seeing it get used more than kind of what we thought it would be on the C500 Mark II. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, both of them can de-squeeze anamorphic lenses. Right now we're looking at two times and 1.3 times anamorphic lenses. Um, and on, so blah, 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 blah. And then also they have preset modes for shooting uh, in PQ and HLG. Um, something that, you know, in New York City with my clients, nobody does. So um, that's not true. There's one, I have one client who actually shoots HLG um, and because they're doing it live. Um, but other than that, everybody else is shooting log or shooting, you know, shooting the raw gamma and then scaling down to H HDR. So if anybody knows somebody who is shooting straight to an HDR mode, I'd love to talk to them. Uh, both cameras have a 12 GSDI output and both cameras are allow you to upload your own LUTs. If you have DaVinci Resolve, you can make your own LUT and then uh, just stick it in the camera with an SD card and as easy as that. All right, so what are the big differences between the two cameras? Well, first one is the sensors, of course. 
the frame rates you're going to get that faster 4k frame rate out of the c300 mark iii uh the dynamic range you're going to get a little bit more total dynamic range from the c300 mark iii than the c500 um the dual pixel autofocus has expanded frame rates in the c300 mark iii so you can't use it in slow and fast motion and that means your your off speeds uh, whereas you can use it in some select off speeds, such as 120 frames a second or 48 frames a second um, on the C300 Mark III. And uh, there's a couple of things that up until recently, the C300 Mark III was going to have that the C500 didn't. And that was a long GOP mode and also a 1280, uh, 720p mode when you're shooting XFABC. However, we're doing a firmware update that's going to put those into the C500 Mark II as well as proxy recording for XFABC, which originally was not in the C500 Mark II. You could only record proxies in RAW. Um, but now that is coming via a firmware update as well. So those are the major differences between the cameras. Uh, the C500 Mark II is $16,000. The C300 Mark III is coming in at $11,000. Um, C300 Mark III is not out yet. It's supposedly shipping this month. Um, and hopefully we'll see it soon. But C500 Mark II has been out for a couple months now uh, and it's been doing pretty well. So I'm going to dive in past the a list of specs. So we're going to jump into the sensors. Again, C500 Mark II has that full frame, um, full frame sensor, and it can scale down to Super 35, and it can also scale down to Super 16 as well. So you have your options when shooting. Um, it's especially with lenses, what, you know, what lenses you have. You want to shoot a Super 16 lens, like the, my favorite lens of all time, the Canon 8-64. to um, You can use that in, in the Super 16 mode on this camera. Um, whereas the C300 Mark III is a Super 35 sensor. So it obviously it doesn't have access to that 5.9K or that full frame uh, image area, but it does have the Super 16 crop mode. Um, all right, moving on. Let's look at the... D, yeah, it's like a DGO, dual gain output. And this is kind of what really, really sets the C300 Mark III apart. Um, basically what's happening is that every photodiode in the sensor is being um, prior, prioritized at a different gain level. And one that's combined together, that means that there is a gain level that's prioritizing the highlights and one that's prioritizing the low lights. Um, and when that comes, it comes together, what that really does is that it reduces the noise in the shadow detail. And that's how we're achieving a, a higher dynamic range um, than previously. Um, and it's something that you guys are really, people are gonna have to really see for themselves because uh, in my mind, it's the cleanest shadow detail I've ever seen out of a cinema, out of a, a Canon product for sure. Um, it's pretty, pretty incredible. And, uh, doing side-by-side -side tests, it really, you really, really see the difference. So this is going to give people a lot more usable uh, latitude when shooting, uh, um, just a lot more options in post for for saving themselves in case there's a there's exposure error or anything like that. Um, but yeah, really, really exciting stuff. Um, both cameras are run by the Digic DV7 processor. Um, and uh, this is kind of a funny slide <laughs> right here because this is more of a C500 Mark II uh, slide right here showing that the um, that in the C500 Mark II the 5.9K can be used to oversample down to 4K, and uh, and so it's kind of showing the process here of you know debayering. You're getting each color readout um, at the full 5.9K, and then kind of coming back down to 4K. Uh, so this slide itself is, is kind of funny because it doesn't really talk about the C300 Mark III at all. So I'm going to skip by it. Let's look at the body here. All right, so in comparison to the original C500, um, you know, in the days of yore, uh, the camera is much thinner and much shorter. Um, now, if we look at the C300 Mark III compared to the C300 Mark II, Again, then, uh, smaller and shorter. Um, and again, both of the bodies, the C500 Mark II and the C300 Mark III bodies are exactly the same. There is a way to tell the difference. So say you have a rental house and you don't, you don't, when you store things on the shelves, you're not putting them in your cases. You have the cameras sitting on the shelves. 
if I have them all sitting there, how am I going to be able to tell what camera is what if I'm looking at? Well, there's two ways. Uh, one is obviously it says C300 Mark III on the side on the card slot door. Uh, the other way is that if you look at the C500 Mark II, it has a little gray tab in the very front, whereas the C300 Mark III has a black tab in the very front. So uh, if rental houses want to stick their lens mounts facing out on the shelves, you'll be able to tell right away what camera you have. Uh, other than that, though, everything is exactly the same. And that's the, all the dimensions and the weight coming in at 3.9 pounds. Let's do a quick run through of this camera we're looking at from the, from the lens port on. All right. So we have the video, the Canon uh, proprietary video part. That's the Hiroshi connector that you'll see on the, see on the C700, you see it on the C200, um, and now C500 Mark II and C300 Mark III. Uh, as well as it really started the C300 Mark II when we went to those separate Hiroshi cables um, for video outputs. <clears throat> so um, this allows you to use not only the included touchscreen LCD monitor, but also the uh, EVF V70, which is the viewfinder that's used mostly with the C700. And that is a, a beautiful, beautiful viewfinder. Um, and it matches really, really well with this series of cameras. Um, so the camera itself ships with an e standard EF mount. And again, those are interchangeable. We have a couple other mounts that I'll talk about. Um, any button that you see on, on, on any of our Cinema EOS cameras, any button that has a number on it can be reassigned. And the body alone has 15 different reassignable buttons, uh, which is kind of brilliant. So we go to the side of the camera, you can see where uh, there's a big mass of the buttons right there um, that you can all reassign. But for, from the factory outset, where you go, we've added a, uh, a LUT button that's basically a LUT on off button. So you can quickly bounce back and forth between whatever LUT you're using and, um, and then looking at the log output. Um, we've got the CF Express and the, uh, and the SD card slots are behind a door there. Um, and there's a, an air intake just for, for those. Um, and you'll see why. And then there's also slow and fast um, and off speed frame rate access now from the outside buttons. Prior to this, you had to go into the menu typically um, in order to, to go in and change, especially in the C300 Mark III, you had to go into the menu and you had to access uh, slow and fast shooting and then you had to change it. And it was it was a little bit of a process to actually to, to change the frame rates of the cameras. And now uh, you can do it with just a couple of button presses. And that's something I really, really love about this camera. Um, and both of these cameras is that I, for me personally, I, I despise menus and I want a camera that I can set up and I never have to go into the menu ever when I'm shooting with it. Now, obviously there's gonna be a couple of times when you have to go into the camera menu, black balancing, things like that. But I want my day to be menu free. And I feel like with these cameras and the amount of buttons we have, and now with some of the buttons being resignable for slow and fast motion that you can actually, actually kind of achieve a, a menu free workflow, um, which is very, very exciting for me. Do, do, do. Let's look at the back. Uh, so BPA60 or A30 batteries is what we use to, to power the body. And these are the same batteries as the C300 Mark II, same batteries as the XF705, same batteries as the C200. Uh, so starting to get a little bit ubiquitous there in the Canon line. Um, we've, on top of the of that battery port there, but it's underneath that door that's hanging out right, right here. That's the expansion uh, expansion unit I/O port, and I'll talk about the expansion units in a little bit. But quickly, a rundown of the the out inputs and outputs in the camera. We have a 3G SDI monitor output there. There's the 12G SDI. So this 12G SDI is going to give you 4K through one cable instead of having to do. Previously, you would have to do use 3G S four 3G SDIs to get 4K output, but now we can output. Um, 60 frames per second. It's uh, 60 frames per second, 10 bit 422 4K out through one SDI cable. But you got to make sure that your monitor, of course, has a 12G input on that. Um, coming down, we got a time code input and output, which is uh, a relief for people who have the C200, I'm sure, because um, <laughs> we neglected that on the C200. But now, so yeah, so time code input and output there. We have HDMI output, which will also give you a 10 bit. Uh, 422 4K signal. Uh, we got the length 
controller, which gives you rudimentary camera control with various LAN accessories. Um, headphone jack, two XLRs built into the body, so no more dealing with the, the clamshell of the C300 Mark II. Uh, and then also the power input is a four pin XLR. Um, and that's very exciting because instead of like dealing with proprietary Limo cables or things like that, it's a pretty standard four pin that a lot of uh, other cameras use out there in the industry. Um, boo, boo, boo. Moving on to the, the other side. So I talked about the the other side, the, the dumb side of the camera is all pretty much air intake and exhaust vents. Um, and this is nice because if, if you ever used a C200 in shoulder rig, you would, uh, you would feel a nice, uh, nice bit of wind hitting the back of your head or your ear. <laughs> because the, uh, the exhaust of that camera was on the operator side. So everything's been moved to, um, to the, the, the dummy side of the camera, which is nice, including the manual uh, audio controls for the, the XLRs. Um, and this is gonna be something that I think it's, it's, I'm really curious to talk to people about how they think or how that works for their workflow. Because um, you know, typically audio controls like this would be on the, the operator side, but, um, but yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, underneath that cap right there is a, an airy rosette, which works with our uh, standard hand grip that comes with the camera. Um, or you can use it for an extender or any other kind of uh, airy rosette accessory if you want. Uh, so I guess the next slide is gonna be what's in the box. No, it's the top, I lied. It's the top of the camera. <laughs> and uh, the top of the camera is redesigned quite a bit from our previous Cinema US cameras and it's, it's much flatter. Um, the top handle now not only connects in via a quarter 20, but it also slides in kind of in a dovetail type motion um, into this, this shoe mount right here. It's definitely by far the most stable top handle that Canon's ever provided for a cinema US camera. You got um, quarter 20s out the wazoo. You got six quarter 20s right you know, right on the top of the camera. And one interesting thing to actually point out is the position of uh, the the focal plane uh, marking and also the the tape hook is that they line up perfectly with these quarter twenties right here. So if you're using like a cine tape or something like that, um, you can line up the horns of the cine tape right at the uh, center line. So that's pretty neat. Uh, do do moving on. This is what's in the box, right? So both of these cameras, they come with obviously the camera body. You get the Canon uh, hand grip there. Uh, which is actually the same hand grip as the C200 as well. And it's interchangeable with the C200, but not with the C300 Mark II. Uh, there's the fancy new top handle that I was talking about, very much sturdier. Um, the, L, uh, the LVM2, which is a uh, the, our LCD monitor, um, it works with the Canon proprietary uh, video output. But it also is a touchscreen monitor for autofocus. So when I'm in DPAF, I can touch the screen or tap the screen, and it will uh, will focus on where I touch. Um, very nice, like this C200 uh, screen, but a little bit larger, about a, a third of an inch larger than the C200 screen. Um, and then you get a BPA60 battery. So you get one of the larger, uh, longer life batteries. You get a single slot charger. Um, you get one of the proprietary cables I was talking about, uh, shotgun mic mount, um, and you get a, and a camera strap as well. What you don't get is you don't get an AC power supply, um, but I don't think it's such a big problem because it's a pretty, it's a pretty common power supply with a four pin XLR that you can find. On. I talked about expansion units. So these are the three expansion units right now that, that we have. Um, the EVF B50, yeah, you probably noticed as I was going through that this camera did not have that standard Canon viewfinder that's been on the back of every one of our Cinema EOS cameras. Um, that was really kind of 50-50 love and hate. Um, some people liked having that built-in viewfinder. A lot of people did not like having that built-in viewfinder. So uh, we said now to make an expansion unit to give the people the option to have that viewfinder or not. Viewfinder or not. And, the nice thing about that is that it's going to work with a lot more of your your gimbal systems without that viewfinder on there. Um, but if you need it, you can have that. You have it. Uh, the EUV1 is a, a very interesting 
the unit because what it does is it adds the Genlock and RS422 and Ethernet connection, and that's all it gives you. Um, this is definitely something where we're looking for more like low level broadcast or system integration, uh, that kind of thing where people are like, we just need Genlock and we just need RS422 control, or I just want the Ethernet just so I have uh, some rudimentary camera control. Um, this is where people are going to be looking like for that. And then we have the EUV2, uh, which is which is the big guy, which adds up quite a few things. And I believe actually I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself here. So yeah, <laughs> there's a little bit better look at the EVF V50 um, and how it looks like when it's attached onto the back of the camera. Now, one thing that's important to note is that uh, you can only use one expansion unit at the same time. And then there's the EUV1 with the uh, covers removed to show you the Genlock and then the RS-422 connector and the ethernet. Uh, and then finally, yes, the EUV2. And this adds quite a bit of functionality. So not only can you see that it adds a V-lock battery plate right away, but it gives you two more XLR inputs. So that gives you four, four channels of XLR. You can you have four usable XLRs going at the same time um, with that camera. And on the other side here, what we have is a three pin fisher. This is going to supply you with the 24 volt three pin fisher that you might be used to with a, an air camera or something like that. But one thing of note is that it does not give you run and stop. So only power. Moving on down, you got the Genlock, you got the RS422, you got the Ethernet for FTPing or rudimentary camera control. And then you got the, the lens uh, control Hero C. So this is if I'm using like a cinema servo lens or a two thirds inch broadcast lens, uh, this is that, that connector that you connect into um, the lens with to give you start stop and auto iris and all of that jazz. Um, and I think for rental houses and everything, this is kind of a you know one to one purchase with the camera. Like this is kind of a part of the kit right out the, the, the gate. Um, moving on to do, do, do. interchangeable lens mounts. I talked about them real quick. What do we have available right now? We have a PLO mount and we have a locking EF mount. And again, the camera ships with a standard EF mount, but if you need some more robustness, um, maybe you need, a, you know, a little bit, if you're really, really jamming on the follow focus on your lenses, um, and you want to reduce a little bit of flex in the, the lens mount, the EF, the locking EF mount um, is kind of the way to go. Um, it's very, it kind of com combines the best of both worlds of, both, of the EF, of all the EF uh, electronic integration. And also it gives you a, a positive lock as well. Um, but the PL mount, I think is what most people are gonna be interested in because this opens up obviously the world of, of lenses to all PL mount lenses. Um, our particular PL mount has Cook Eye integration. So it does not have LDS integration, but it does have Cook Eye. Um, and you get a whole group of shims with those lens mounts as well. So yeah, it's very, very easy to change the lens mount out. It's four screws. It, you know, I think I, I, I was able to do it in 25 seconds. Um, very, very quick, but uh, it's a good idea to have a collimator, of course. Um, Hey Paul, can I ask a question? Yeah, um, of course. I have to say, I, I love the uh, the almost mini free um, you know a workflow idea, mm -hmm. like with the buttons, and I even love how they're yeah. even labeled, even though they can yeah. be you know programmable to anything. Uh, I think that's actually a step in the the right direction. I think that's huge, actually, uh, kind of getting away from the menu idea. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing. Uh, just to point out uh, and make note of is the XLR being built into the body now because yeah. that's you know just in my thought of the C300 Mark II uh, mm -hmm. from a house perspective, kind of building that into the body is is definitely the way to go. Um, are those lens mounts interchangeable between the bodies though? So the same PL mount can be used on either or. That would be good info for a rental house to have, or is it a separate PL mount for the C500 Mark II compared to the C300 Mark or, uh, C300 Mark III? No, yeah, it's exactly the same. So all all okay. accessories will work across the board. Okay. So yeah, so if you don't want to buy one for each, you don't have to buy one for each camera. You can have like a couple, you know, okay. sitting there, yeah, and, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, they're not matched up via serial number. They're not, you know, anything like that. 
Um, yeah, with a lot of our yeah. clients being rental houses, you know, it makes mm -hmm. sense. That, you know, when they come to invest in uh, Canon products, that they are uh, you know interchangeable between the cameras. Um, and then also the uh, EU V2 uh, uh, mm -hmm. that's in uh, V mount is that also available in gold mount as well? Different markets. So not yeah, not available in gold mount straight out of Canon. Um, but if you've ever seen a, a V mount, you uh, <laughs> you know how kind of easy it is to swap out the the mount to a to a gold mount. A lot of around, and a lot of people, uh, owner operators, clients of mine who have the C five hundred and have it have swapped out swapped out theirs, um, just a back plate to a a, a gold mount. Um, yeah, but it's not something that Canon is providing. They're providing just the V mount. So, okay, sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, how are we doing? How am I doing on time? Can I keep Can I keep rolling, or do you need to to kick me off here? What's the no, I <laughs> If you want to keep rolling for for a little bit, that'd be yeah. great. If you want to touch base okay. on this, but then if we could kick it over, um, you know, yeah. right quickly over, just that way, you know, our audience has time to uh, get an understanding of the the lens and um, also the the HDR monitor. That'd be great. You got it. Absolutely. I'll just I'll just roll and just you know just yell at me if I'm getting a little too too into things here. So. <laughs> um. So moving on. So if you can see my slide right here, the C500 Mark II raw light. And raw light, again, is, is this is uh, really a great direction. We saw it first with the C200, where you integrated raw light into the C200. Um, but it really, it really has, uh, has you know, taken its stride with both the C500 Mark II and, and now the C300 Mark III. Uh, so C500 Mark II, what am I, what am I getting here? So in raw, if I shoot full frame, I'm getting 5.9K. I'm getting it up to 60 frames a second. Any frame rate 30 and below is 12 bit. Any frame rates that's above 30 is 10 bit. All right. And that's coming in at 2.1 gigabits per second. So that's, you know, it's raw light, but still raw is a, is a pretty big workflow. Um, but, you know, kind of compare that to the raw that you're getting out of the C700, say. C700 full frame raw comes in at around 25 megabytes per frame, right? So, you know, the reduction in, uh, in data rate and still maintaining the, uh, the raw is pretty, um, pretty amazing. Now, when I shoot 4K raw, what happens is that I crop into the Super, uh, super 35 um, crop of the sensor. And this makes sense, right? Because if it's raw, um, I'm cropping into the actual uh, 4K pixels on it. So there again on C500 Mark II, I can do up 60 frames a second in 4K raw. Uh, same rules apply with the bit depth. Um, 30, up to 30 and 30, 12 bit, anything below or anything above that, uh, you're getting 10 bit. And this reduces the file size down to one gigabit per second. Um, on the 2K side though, this is with Super 16 mode. So when I pop into Super 16, I'm popping into 2K. And uh, this is where I can go up to 120 frames per second. Uh, however, the 30, 30 frame per second rule still applies with the 12 bit and the 10 bit. Um, and this reduces the file size though to 250 megabits per second. So a much, much, uh, a much, much more or easier amount of data to handle right there. And you can see with the CF Express cards, if a 512 gigabit, gigabyte uh, card, how much time I'm going to be getting 32 minutes at, at 5.9 K 65 minutes at 4 K or 270 minutes at 2 K. Now when I'm shooting raw, <clears throat> uh, I'm shooting the DCI of all of in raw. So I can't shoot UHD in raw. Um, if I want to shoot UHD, I'm going to have to go to XFAVC for that, or you just need to crop from, from the raw. Um, what's my next slide? So C300 Mark III raw light. And again, this looks very familiar, but the 4K mode is the full sensor because it's a Super 35 sensor. So that's the full sensor and I'm getting 120 frames per second. But again, the 30 frame per second uh, thing applies to the bit depth as well. So 30 frames per second and below, you're getting 12 bit. When I go above that, you're shooting 10 bit. And again, one gigabit per second. And if you remember from the C200 as well, the C200 was also 4K, one gigabit per second. 
um, in the cinema raw light. So you can see how it's really kind of going across all, all of these cameras. Um, the 2K is also a super 16 millimeter crop up to 180 frames per second, but still the 30 frame per second rule applies to the bit depth. Um, and then the same data savings as the as on the C500 uh, Mark II there, 250 megabits per second. Let's take a look at XFAVC. Now this is where it gets a little bit more varied um, when I'm shooting. So XFAVC is our, comp our codec, compressed codec. Um, our version of AVC, all camera, you know, all camera manufacturers seem to have a version of AVC. Um, and so, yeah, uh, the, the, the 4K, you can shoot either the 4096 DCI or the 3840 UHD. In um, the C500 Mark II, again, we can go up to 60 frames per second. Now, something interesting here is that on the C500 Mark II, I can shoot an XFABC full frame. So I can shoot the, the full coverage of the sensor, but it gets oversampled to 4K. So in XFABC, I cannot shoot 5.9K. I can only shoot 5.9K in RAW, but I can still shoot the full sensor coverage and have it sampled down to um, 4K. And that makes for a very, a, a very, very nice looking 4K right there. But all XFABC in uh, these cameras is 422, 10-bit, um, no matter what kind of what mode you're shooting there. Um, so again, 4K, C500 Mark II, we're getting 60 frames per second um, is the max that we can do. Um, and you can see the, the data rate difference. If I'm shooting in my base frame rate of 5994, I'm shooting 810 megabits per second. Uh, if I shoot in 2398 or 2997, base frame rate's 410 megabits per second. All right, so, and then over on the 2K side, when I go to 2K XFABC, um, <clears throat> if I am shooting in 2K full frame, um, then I am getting one to 60 frames per second. But if I shoot in super 16 crop mode, then I'm able to get 120 frames per second. And, uh, and again, so the, the, you save a little bit of savings there. Um, data savings when you shoot in, in 2K, you get, 310 megabits per second in the 5994 um, base frame rate, or 160 megabits per second uh, when you're shooting in 2398 or 29.97. So I mentioned earlier, the proxy to SD card is for raw light only. That will not be the case come the firmware update that is coming sometime in July. So um, that's very exciting. And something that people have been really asking for for the C500 Mark II. The C300 Mark III didn't have to worry about this. C300 Mark III had uh, proxies in, in all modes, no matter what. Um, so XFABC in the C300 Mark III, again, it doesn't have the full frame sensor, so there's nothing to oversample. So your 4K, you're getting your DCI, your UHD up to 60 frames a second um, in base frame rate, but you can do 120 frames a second if you go into slow and fast motion and you don't crop on the sensor at all. Um, hey, Paul, hey, Paul yes, if I could just interrupt you there real quickly, because I just want to make sure that we have time, because I know that there's other yeah. members on, on your side that um, do, you know, need to speak, and we want, we're eager to hear, hear on their products. So uh, just want to, yeah, just get a little time check just in case, uh, you know, so we don't mm -hmm. run out of time for the other groups. Yeah, yeah, let me, um, let me blow through the slide real fast, and then I, I think we can kind of wrap it up. After this, um, awesome. you know, obviously it's it's a you know it's a lot to 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 sneak into, there, but uh, no, I, know. I definitely you I don't want to, and I don't want to encroach on anybody else's time either. So I appreciate you letting me just yeah. flow. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. So again, um, going back to this was the 120 frames per second in 4K on the Super 16 crop mode side, 180 frames per second is possible. Um, but if I didn't do, um, but I could go up to, uh, let's see, blah, 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 blah. That's right. I believe I could go to 120 if I'm doing 2K, oops, uh, 2K non super 16 crop in XFABC. I think that slide is wrong, but I, I can't remember. So <laughs> I need to check that. Um, but there is a bit of data savings as, as well on that. Um, and out of the box of this camera, 
there is also a long gop mode and for 4k um, as well and i can tell you right now the long gop mode instead of 410 megabits per second long gop mode will give you 160 megabits per second it's basically that in 4k um so i think that's something that people are, are going to be really happy about the c300 mark iii um but c500 owners are going to get it in july so that's not a big loss to them either um uh, yeah i think my next slide was basically just compatible frame rates but the big thing to talk about is the proxies will work on all frame rates which is something that didn't what didn't happen for previous cameras of ours um you had proxies only working at certain frame rates but now for both of these cameras you'll get a proxies at every single frame rate that you shoot um and there are plugins and native support across the board uh, for the main NLEs as well. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's probably good that we can kind of, kind of bring it to a close now. And if anybody has any questions, just shout them out at me. Yeah, thank you for the time, everybody. I'm sorry for taking up so much. <laughs> no, it's oh, actually, it was all, all, sorry. It's just all really good info. Um, yeah. it, you know, fantastic. Uh, we just wanna make sure we, we uh, especially get to the, um, uh, the the Cine Servo 25 to 250, and then also the yeah. HDR model. Um, Ryan, yeah. do you want to take it away uh, with the lens? Yeah, absolutely. And I think I can do that. Oh. Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah, so once again, my name is Ryan Snyder, pro rep out of uh, Philadelphia. And uh, yeah, going to just introduce this awesome new Cine Servo 25 to 250. Um, if you are familiar with our existing offerings, uh, you know that we've had that uh, uh, 17 to 120 was the first one out, uh, really made, its, uh, made a name for itself as far as a, a, a large sensor cinema style uh, servo zoom lens, uh, pretty much became a standard out there for uh, a lot of these organizations that were moving from two third inch into large format. Uh, they wanted the uh, uh, Super 35 coverage, but with that familiar broadcast operation and feel. And that's what the uh, 17 to 120 gave us. Uh, then we were uh, petitioned by the wildlife side of things to give them a, uh, a, a real long version, uh, the, uh, the 20 by. So a 50 to 1000 was made. And that really tested us as far as um, creating a, a lightweight Super 35 cinema zoom lens uh, that, uh, you know, was portable enough for these, uh, you know, these camera crews to be lugging around in jungles in bad situations. Um, so we used a lot of the uh, know-how from our engineers and making that small and light of a lens into um, the middle ground, which obviously is be uh, no, you know, we needed something to, to go in the middle range. So that is where this guy fits into. And it's that 25 to 250 range. It also has an extender on it, which is going to take that out to 37.5 to 375 millimeters. So a really sweet range. Um, and uh, we've got it all covered with the, the three of these. Um, just real quick, the specs, super 35 coverage on this guy. It does have that it build in extender. That'll give you a one stop light loss. Uh, but uh, also, you know, give you that uh, extended range there. It is a T2.95 to 3.95 uh, sensitivity. So extremely fast. It only starts the ramp at 187 millimeters. So you're basically getting a seven to one zoom range out of it uh, wide open. Uh, 11 blade iris, which deals really nicely, gives you that uh, beautiful bokeh and, uh, you know, deals really nicely with the... Uh, um, uh, highlights, four inch close focus distance. So it's very versatile, even though it is a, a medium telephoto, you've got nice working distance out of it. It's got that removable drive grip. So it's the same drive grip as the seven, uh, 17 to 120. Uh, however, and this is really useful for rental houses to know that those grips, even though they're identical physically, they have unique encoding uh, for the uh, virtual systems, so they cannot be swapped. So from one lens to another, you're not going to be able to take one off and use them. Um, they're also keyed serial number wise. So even, even a grip uh, from uh, the, the same lens will not be able to be used. So you do have to keep that, that grip and the lens married together. Uh, 
underneath that servo grip, there are three 20 pin Hiroshi. Uh, those are for your digital inputs. Those is your, um, you set up your focus and zoom demands and it'll also work uh, with the, the virtual systems. The lens comes in either EF or PL mount. That PL mount does have that cook eye on there as Paul was mentioning. You take that servo off and you've got uh, your different uh, gear pitches for full cinema manual operation. And you can see the details of that there. Uh, as, as well as some dimensions for the first time. So if I, uh, when I, when I show you that, that's really where you understand how important this lens is. Uh, in the EF mount, you're gonna get dual pixel AF, uh, chromatic aberration, peripheral illumination correction, all the good stuff from, uh, from an EF uh, mount lens to an EF camera. Um, so here's, here's really the astounding part. If you look at the 17 to 120 on the right-hand side, you're looking at 6.3 pounds and 10.3 inches. This 25 to 250 is coming in just over 11 inches and 6.7 pounds. It's very, very similar to it. So the fact that we were able to pack all of that telephoto range into a really lightweight compact package is uh, just a, another testament to the engineering. Um, it's very similar uh, as far as sensitivity as well. And then that extender, like I said, it's a 37.5 to 375 when you engage it with one stop loss. So you're going to a T4.4 to 5.9. Uh, however, the little bonus feature here is due to the, uh, you know, the optics of that extender, it actually magnifies the image circle up. So this will cover a full frame camera uh, when, the, uh, when the extender is engaged. So it's a little extra, little bonus uh, without having to go through a, a big conversion, an expensive process or anything like that. You, you can use this on a full frame if you want to. And the only downside to that is that extender uh, pushes out a little bit far, so it won't fit on anything with a mirrored shutter. Finally, uh, it does have the macro mode, uh, just like the uh, other Cine Servo lenses, and that'll get you a really close 25 centimeter from the front uh, of the lens. Um, so extremely versatile, the same kind of uh, great uh, quality that the, uh, the Cine Servo line is known for, being par focal, um, you know, great, great optics all the way through, great MTF, and um, the fact that it's that familiar feel with uh, really uh, a lot of good servo uh, operation, but being in that cinema side. So it's got that nice coating uh, for warm color uh, rendition. So happy to take any questions from you. Uh, hi, bro Ryan. I'll, I'll, I'll come off the handle straight off. Um, obviously, more from a, a cinema background. Um, just into this new, congratulations on the new 10 to 1. I think it's long overdue and um, we know your products and they're great. Um, from a, the, the ramping function, anytime I've spoken to a DP, it's always been sort of the, the tough call on the lens, Any you know, on the CN17. Uh, um, is kind of, they've always had to work with the higher end um, T-stop on the lens. So if they were using, to be able to use the full range of the lens. So if they were having to zoom in and out, they would hate to, they wouldn't want to ramp on the zoom. So with a new lens, you, you, would, you would need to, once again, be sort of being in the same sort of pull where either you're going to be pulling through the zoom and on a ramp, or you're going to be using the sort of higher end of the T-stop. Uh, is this something, that, again, we're talking in the Sony market, is this something that can be overcome in time? Mm. It, it, you know, any lens is gonna run into ramping when you're, when, you're, when you're designing it with some portability in mind. Um, it's that front uh, entrance iris uh, that you just can't get uh, a, a straight through on, on that kind of magnification when you're trying to keep the lens somewhat portable. We can make the lens much bigger uh, and, and get around that, uh, that ramp, uh, but uh, that is the limitation right now. One thing that I do note to people that are using the servo on this lens is uh, one of the features that uh, is built into the servo drives uh, that broadcast users use a lot is the zoom tracking where you can actually limit um, that, that, uh, that tracking. So if you wanna shoot this lens wide open and not run into that ramp, you can set the far end of the tracking at 187 millimeters and you'll never even have to worry about that ramp. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as a true cine application, you will need to be aware of that ramp and just know where it comes into play. Um, 
And uh, of course, you know, we're a lens manufacturer first. We make great cameras, but we're an optics company. Uh, I'm sure we've looked into uh, all sorts of ways to, to make a very fast lens, uh, but unfortunately, none of that right now uh, falls into the capability of being a, a portable ENG style. Yeah, I guess yeah. you're trying to accommodate both both markets. I mean, it's that's exactly kind of like it. like having a Porsche and can't get out a third going to fourth. Um, you know, you if you want to be using a lens in the cine world, you, we'd be classing the lens as a T4. And then, and then not having to worry about an iris ram throughout the range. That, that, I mean, that's any cinematographer. You would just go, you know, you wouldn't even expect that of the AC because, again, when you're starting to pull iris, your depth of field changes, everything changes. Of course. You, you know, so I understand, I understand the, 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 the uh, mathematics behind it. And then um, just on the back end of the lens, when you, you know, you, you said that the, the, you have a, um, a 1.5. Um, extend on the rear with a 1.5 um, loss in light. Um, oh, one stop. That, one, one stop, stop loss. loss. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry. So one stop loss light. That is, that is quite an achievement um, to say the least. Um, is there anything that we should know about how you achieve that? Or um, I'm quite interested how that relates to the Super 35 and the full frame. And is that due to magnification? I'm, I, I, I don't understand the chemistry there, so I'm trying to... That's, that's exactly what it is. Yes, that's exactly what it is. When you engage that 1.5, it's a magnification, not only of the focal length, but of the image circle. And at that point, that image circle is, is large enough to cover full frame. I've never, I've, never, I've never heard that, but I, mean, I was kind of trying to think of other lenses, just let's say fixed zoom, uh, a zoom lenses where you're putting on a a doubler, you know, or extend of any sort. I've never seen the image circle get any larger. So there has to be some something clever inside there. Yeah, and uh, well, uh, I wish we had an engineer on, but we don't. <laughs> and I, I, I'm I'm not uh, quite equipped to be able to answer the technical aspects of it. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thanks for your comments, though. So uh, I believe we're throw it over to Charles for uh, for a little look at the Sumeray. Hi, good morning, everybody. Well, afternoon or evening, <laughs> everywhere. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. So I wanted to introduce myself. I'm uh, Charles Ablon, and I'm the senior trainer over at Canon Burbank. Um, if you guys have never been to Canon Burbank before. I uh, urge you guys, when once all this is done, I invite you guys to come over and uh, come check us out. We have an awesome facility over here on the West Coast. Um, so uh, first off, I wanted to do a brief history. Um, Canon, I, for, uh, I wanted to make sure that you guys are seeing the right screen. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. I can't see anybody's faces right yeah, now. Yeah, Charles, we're the good. Presentation. Thank you. Okay. First, a little bit of history. Canon has had a rich heritage in creating beautiful optics for the cinema industry for over 40 years. Um, in the mid 70s, Canon addressed the growing need of cinematographers for fast compact glass. And to meet these needs, Canon engineers designed the now legendary K35 set of uh, uh, cinema primes. And in 1977, Canon won the Oscar for technical achievement in optical design for work in movies such as Aliens, American Hustle, Manchester by Sea. And they chose the K35 because of their distinct signature look. Um, let's jump over to 2011 and Canon introduces the Cinema EOS line of cameras. And to complement this new era of cameras, Canon also announced the CNE zoom and prime lenses. The CNE lenses have developed their own following because of their excellent reproduction of skin tones and unrivaled sharpness and compact size. And now Canon is gonna take that heritage and creating award-winning glass and give it an unexpected twist. Introducing the Canon Sumire. So this is the kanji symbol for sum Sumire. Um, and uh, Sumire is the Japanese name for a violet flower. Um, and the English name for that flower is actually called the Fuji Don. Um, so just a little interesting tidbit there. Um, Canon engineers named these lenses uh, Sumire for the simple fact that they bloom and reveal their true beauty as you open up the aperture. At wide open, the lens gives you a truly interesting look. Um, the Sumeria lenses have a very distinct vintage feel to them. 
from the smooth rendering of the skin to the beautiful out of focus backgrounds. As you can see here, Ernesto Lomelli created this uh, short film for us um, uh, that kind of tests uh, most of the focal lengths that was available to him at the time. Um, but due to streaming limitations, I can't play the video, um, but we're gonna share a link after this presentation so that you guys can see for yourself. So right here, we're seeing the um, 85 millimeter. And uh, to me, the 85 millimeter best represents the characteristics of the Sumeria Primes. Um, in this still grab, um, you can see just the out of focus, how smooth the, the skin tones are, um, has really pleasing bokeh in the background, really pleasing tones. And I just, I just really love the look of this uh, lens. Um, all the way to the widest angle lens and uh, the 14 millimeter. You can see how uh, it beautifully renders the image and it's still consistent throughout the, the line. Um, the Sumire has an 11 blade clickless iris um, and it covers full frame and super 35. It is our first PL mounted lens with a uh, PL mounted prime lens. Let me make that uh, clarification. Uh, with 114 millimeter front diameter and 103 millimeter filter inner diameter. Um, and you can easily swap these setups with your existing CNE glass, um, given you have the, the mount change for your camera. Um, they are um, the same size as the CNE um, uh, lenses. And so all your accessories will not need to be repositioned um, tremendously. Um, dual focus markings that glow in the dark. We have same, the same gear positioning, um, 0.8 mod and 32 pitch um, for the focus and um, smooth 300 degree focus rotation for accurate and repeatable focusing. Um, that. Uh, th this has the same gear positioning pitch as the CNU lenses. Um, and so it allows you to just inter interchange with them uh, as needed. Um, and then, oh, we have that. Um, the seven lens set will include the 14 millimeter T3.5, uh, 20 millimeter, 24, 35, 50, 85, and 135 at T2.5. Um, the price will be at $7,410 per lens. Um, and uh, today, uh, all the, the whole set is now complete, so everything is available um, for you guys. There is a really cool article um, that Film and Digital Times uh, did on the Sumire. Um, this is the, the bit.ly link that I created with the file. So if you're interested in downloading that, um, uh, that full, um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, magazine, I really urge you to do that. There's an interesting story about um, how the Sumire lenses came about and a factory tour in, in our lens, uh, cinema lens factory in Japan with uh, our um, Canon USA people, Jay Sanjo and Larry Thorpe uh, joining them on, the, on that tour. Um, so without further ado, could I, I'll be open to answer any questions on the Sumeri plan. Charles, I've got a question for you. Um, yes. Canon obviously quite famous um, for your sequels. I guess is one way to put it. You Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV. Yeah. How how close were you to calling these um, K thirty five Mark II? And and, and so I, I yeah, the K thirty fives are not that that formula is not repeatable. There's just ingredients in those lenses that are just not even legal anymore, and so. Um, uh, the, K, the K35s were unique for their day. What I love about the, the Sumire is it brings um, portions of that legacy forward with modern aesthetics. And, and so um, there's, there's quirkiness to older glass too, um, but there's beauty in the characteristics that's still reminiscent of the older glass. But it, it, I wouldn't say that it's a sequel to the K35. I think this, is, this stands separate of the K35. Um, uh, but it has its own beautiful look to it. Um, what's interesting about these lenses too is that when you stop down the lens past uh, T2.8 for most of the focal lengths, uh, or sorry, T4 for most of the focal lengths, uh, the look is completely gone. 
And so you're able to have two types of lenses per se. And so you have a, a look that is more reminiscent of CNE glass so that you can match it with existing CNE glass. Um, but if you needed that look for a certain uh, shot, then you can open open it back up and then you have this like really beautiful, really beautiful rendition of skin tones and out of focus and all that. And so you know, that, just to answer your question succinctly, it's not a sequel to the K35, but it does harken back to that legacy. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, any other questions for the Super A? Well, I just had and one. With that, yeah, sure. Sorry, um, just real quick. It's more about all of your products. I'm just kind of curious, how has COVID affected delivery timeframes? Uh, so you mentioned that they're available. Are they, you know, so they are available to purchase now. I know that the 25 to uh, 250 isn't available uh, yet anyway, um, but has that, has COVID kind of pushed the delivery timeframe for it or um, just in terms of all your products in general? You know, surprisingly, for the most part, um, everything is pretty much on schedule. There's a couple of products that's, that's been delayed, but for the most part, everything is, is on schedule. Sumer rays are available. Um, 25 to 250 will be available really soon. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Nate McFarlane um, with a uh, presentation on the displays. Thank you, everybody. Hello, everybody. Just confirming real quick that everybody can see the PowerPoints here. Good, thank yeah. you, Ryan. Awesome. So I'm just gonna run quickly through because I wanna leave some time for questions at the end here. I'm gonna give you a quick presentation that just kind of outlines our entire lineup of HDR reference displays. Um, as Charles said, my name is Nate McFarland. I'm a senior quality engineer. I work out of our Melvo office and I handle all of our projector and 4K displays. So our entire lineup has three different size variations, 17 inch, 24 inch, and 31 inch. There's currently six current products. Um, just to give you a brief history, much like Charles just did, quick little history lesson here. We entered the display market in 2014 with our 3010. It was a 30 inch SDR monitor. A year later, we followed that up with our first iteration of a 24 inch monitor, but both of these were not really proper HDR monitors. Um, these were more geared towards SDR content production and 2016 is when we came out with our first ever true HDR monitor in the 2420. It had a, a thousand nit uh, peak luminance capability, and this kind of cemented our, our first step into that world of HDR uh, reference displays. A year later, we entered into the Fourier of the 17 inch series with our 1710. 2018 was a big year for us. We introduced uh, the bigger brothers of the 2420 and the 1710 in the 2421 and the 1711. Uh, these are the exact same panel as their predecessors. The only difference here being that the SDI's interfaces in the back of the monitors were now 12G capable. We also came out in 2018 with our 2411, which was a slimmer version of the 2420. Um, there was much more design for onset use, whereas the 2420 being a little bulkier in the back wasn't quite as easy to carry around on a set. And then at the tail end of 2019, in early 2020, we just now introduced our, our brand new baby, our 3120. And you'll see here outlined in red with this dashed line, this is kind of the representation of our current lineup. And as you can see at the bottom, we covered the whole range from content acquisition all the way through post. Um, so we have you covered for on onset uh, in editing bays all the way into proper color suites. Now, I just want to go over some quick specification differences. Uh, first thing right off the bat, I will say is that all of our displays across the board are LCD based technology. Now, the individual backlights of each panel differ a little bit, and I can dive a little more into that a little later, but just note that all of these are LCD panels. Now, when we're talking resolution, uh, first thing that jumps out right away for a lot of people is that our lineup does not have a HD monitor. The lowest resolution we support is UHD, 
And don't let that mean that our monitors cannot display HD upscaled to the native resolution of these panels. We can, of course, take 720, 1080 signals, but the native resolution of the panels is what you see here. So across the board, we're full DCI, except for our 17 series, which is that UHD, which is more popular for the broadcast users. Now, peak luminance. Um, one quick thing to note with peak luminance uh, across the board for all of our displays, when I say peak luminance, I mean edge to edge. So the numbers that you're seeing here can be withstained across the entire width of the display, not just a small you know, test pattern, 10%, 20%. Um, so that's a, one thing that we're really proud of. We're really uh, you know, proud of our technology that we've kind of adapted over the years. And we're, we're proud to say that we can support these luminance levels uh, edge to edge full field. Um, you'll see the 600 nits here for the 17 inch display is in red because that actually changed as of this morning with our new firmware update. Uh, that has been bumped up from the previous 300 nits. Now then when you jump to the 2411, you get 1000 nits full field. The 2420 series, you get 1200 nits full field. And then that 3120, which is meant for pure HDR post-production, you have 2000 nits available full field. Everyone always wants to see 2000 nits full field at trade shows. We always joke, you know, as long as you have your sunglasses, we can let you see it, but it is incredible when you see it in person. Now, black level, uh, you know, this is equally as important as peak luminance. You wanna be able to see uh, details and the highlights and the, the shadows. So once again, you'll notice for the 17 and 2411, this number is in red because this also changed this morning with our new firmware that was released today. Uh, previously, this was at 0 0.005 nits. These have now been upgraded and we've ported some of the image processing algorithms from our newly released 3120 into these older models um, to give them that uh, black level performance boost. So you'll see 0 0.001 nits across the board, except for the 2420 series, which is 0 0.005. Now bit depth, we're 10 bit across the board, except for the 17 inch series is 8 bit. Uh, now all of these panels have internal processing of a bit depth that is higher than the bit depth listed here. So that means that they can accept 10, 12 bit signals as well. Uh, now just jumping into some of the products a little um, more heavily here, 17 inch series. So as we've already said, this is ideal for broadcast and live set just because of the 17 inch form factor and weight is really nice. The 17 inch is also unique in that it's our only model that we sell with accessories. So you can see two accessories here are on the left, you'll see the rack ear mounts. Uh, that's mostly popular for the guys working in the broadcast uh, vans and trucks that need to just mount this to their typical array. And then we off also offer a uh, screen protector here just in case because with it being so light and portable, it's more prone to being dropped or kicked or hit with a C-stand or what have you. Accidents happen on set, so we do offer that for you. Um, you'll see here that most of our displays come with a very easy portable uh, handle and that the 17-inch displays weigh around 17 pounds. So 17-inch, 17 pounds, pretty easy to remember. Very easy to handle with one arm. Now flipping the display around, uh, you'll see here kind of what's going on in the back as far as interfaces are concerned. And this is pretty standard across the board. All of our displays uh, support the same sort of in interface structure. So right away on the left-hand side here, these are the SDI ports. So if you're using the 1710 model, these will be 6G capable. And then if you're using the 1711, they will be 12G capable. Um, so as Paul was saying earlier, the great thing about 12G is that you can get 4K 6422 with one cable. That's a huge deal just as far as, um, you know, especially for the broadcast guys uh, when they're trying to conserve as much weight as possible on trucks um, and just being able to easily have that high quality of a signal and not having to, you know, mess around with four cables now, you can all do it with one. Um, so you'll see here, if you have the 6G model, you'll need two of those cables. If you have the 12G model, you'll need one. Uh, just like the cameras, we also support a 4K capable HDMI port. And then the 17 inch series has your DC 12 volt XLR terminals. And then all of our displays across the board have an ethernet LAN terminal. And this is what you'll use if you're doing a link between multiple monitors. So if you wanted to control all of the monitors simultaneously, you can do uh, ethernet link that way. And then this is also how you're gonna be communicating with our web control tool, which we can talk about a little bit in a few different slides. Um, but that gives you complete remote control of the display um, via web browser. So you don't actually have to be physically pressing the buttons on the displays themselves. 
We also include a tally light system at the top of our displays here that you can see. So this just coincides more for the broadcast folks, uh, just to coincide with that, that three color tally light system uh, that are used on cameras as well. And we like to throw this in here for the 17s because this is a pretty typical array that you'd see in a broadcast environment. You'd have maybe one or two larger 30 inch plus monitors as your kind of director monitors. And then they'd be surrounded by the array of smaller monitors uh, with the different signals and things like that coming from the show. Moving over to the 2411. So the 2411 is actually our most successful model that we have. Uh, it really blends the form factor of the 1710 uh, thinness with the great image quality specs of some of the higher end models. So looking at around the same uh, kind of demographics here for use um, as the 17 series, uh, but because it's a little bit bigger, that does open the gate for more editorial applications as well, as you can see here. Flipping the display around, you'll see pretty much the exact same configuration as the 17s. You have your 12 GSDI terminals um, and the only real difference here is that that DC XLR terminal is 24 volt instead of the 12 volt of the 17s. Another thing I didn't mention when we were talking SDIs, you'll notice that, that there's eight total ports, so four input and four output. So that does support pass through signal chain. So if you wanted to loop a signal through several monitors that we have, that is very easy to do here. Talking uh, logistics for carrying, very similar to the 17 and that you have a carry handle, but now you're going up from 17 pounds to about 26 pounds. Still relatively easy to uh, handle with one arm, no big deal there. Now I put this in here because uh, our 2411 has a boost function um, and I, we kind of need to specify what's actually going on here. So natively the display is 600 nit peak, but when you enable the boost function that puts it up to a thousand nits. Now that does come at the sacrifice of some of the black level, whereas previously you'd have a 0 0.005 black with a boost, now you're raising that up. But this is actually great with the firmware that we're releasing today because this boost chart is no longer applicable. Um, you know, I should have in hindsight put an X through this because uh, now with our 0 0.001 nit firmware upgrade, you'll actually be able to go from 001 black to 1000 nit peak white with the boost mode enabled. So you're kind of getting rid of that limitation, which is great. And then obviously now that you've stepped away from the 17s, uh, you're now stepping into the world 10-bit panel and sub 8-bit. We don't need to cover that. I'm sure all of you guys are very familiar with that. Now, 3120, this is the, the new flagship monitor. Super happy with it. All of the reception has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, this is the true post-production baby of ours now. So that doesn't mean that it can't go on set or in a truck. You just have to know that you have to pay attention to size limitations, um, weight limitations, things like that, because it's not as not nearly as thin as your 17 or your 24 series. So we completely redid the backlight design for the 3120. Uh, on the left here, you can kind of see what a conventional backlight would look like. Um, and then on the, the right, that's kind of a representation of what we've done. So we've made three overall changes uh, to the LED backlight system. The first being that you can notice from the images, there's simply more LEDs now. So we've added a significant number of LEDs to the panel, and that's really going to help reduce halation between local, um, local dimming zones. Uh, the next thing we did is we switched from RGB LEDs to white LEDs uh, that are more efficient and also uh, activate that higher luminance value. So that's what allowed us to jump all the way up to 2000 nits. And then we also made a lot of improvements in our local domain and image processing algorithms that bring it all together. And that's what enables that 0 0.001 nit all the way up to the 2000 nit full field, uh, which gives you an incredible 2000 nit full field contrast ratio, which is a spec that we are immensely proud of at Canon. And then the great thing about the 3120 is that all of these specifications exceed the requirements for Dolby Vision mastering uh, certified facilities. So if you're not familiar, um, it, when you're going to build your post-production facility, if you want it to be Dolby Vision certified, uh, engineers from Dolby will come out and actually perform measurements on a variety of your equipment. And one of that being your HDR monitor. And you can see there's kind of nine test criteria here. Um, and you can see that they have their minimum and their preferred specifications. They actually just changed recently a few months ago. The preferred specifications for peak luminance is now 2000 nits, which is great because you know with the 3120, you're already covering that. So this is really a worthwhile investment that you can be future-proofing your 
your facilities here for a while down the road. Just gonna run through this really quickly because I know we are running out of time. Uh, color grayscale reproduction, it's the same across the board. We're supporting all of the SDR and HDR standards here for gamuts. So 709, P3, 2020, ASUS. Same thing with the gamma curves. You know, you have your typical power curves, 2, 2, 2, 4, 2, 6. Um, and then when you're going to the HDR, we have built-in presets for HLG, PQ, uh, CAN, log, S log. Uh, like the cameras, it supports user LUT input. Um, and then we're also compatible with pretty much every color format that's out there. So whether it be RGB, YCPCR, XYZ, uh, everything is covered here. We touched on the importance of 12G SDI support. So with the, those four inputs, you can do four separate independent quad view of four different uh, 4K HDR signals, which is great. And then a great advantage of that too, is that if you wanted to utilize all four of those cables for one image, you can view 8K content, which is rare. I mean, having a display that you can actually see full 8K is, is rare in the industry. Now, obviously that 8K would be down sampled to the native resolution that is 4K, but still being able to have a display to see that 8K footage on is, is very powerful. And then this is my last slide here. Uh, one of the most, you know, uh, prevalent features that we like to boast about our displays is our award-winning toolkit. Um, so our toolkit is a suite of engineering tools that is designed to make the operator of the display's life much easier. Um, you know, HDR standards, we all know, are constantly evolving. So we wanted to give uh, our users a suite of tools that kind of removes ambiguity into images they're seeing. So this means including great monitoring features like you see here on the right with waveform, histogram, luminance monitors, uh, you know, we have peaking outside of gamut views, much like you'd see in your camera systems. And then we have some unique features like our pixel value checker, which allows you to see, you know, the RGB code value of any given pixel, uh, false color. And then the middle image here in black you're seeing is a, a screen grab of our, our web tool um, that can give you complete control and customization there. And this suite of tools did win us an HPA Engineering Excellence Award back in 2018. That's something we're, we're very proud of. Um, and that's actually all I had. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, rant here too long. So I'll kind of throw back to the dynamic folk. So if anyone has any questions, you know, I'm happy to, to help field those now. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think we, uh, that was just an excellent presentation overall, you know, on, on the Canon side, uh, lots of information of about such a, a, a wide family of products and, and, um, one of the questions that came in from the audience I just want to get to is from Gerard Botha. Um, he's asking, is there an, an element of uncoded look or different aesthetic and is the drop off enhanced on the Sumeri range? So that might be a good question for Charles. So we don't have an uncoded element um, in the, in the Sumeri line. Um, it does lend itself to a very distinct look overall, like um, especially when it comes to Canon lenses. Uh, Canon lenses are uh, are very sharp and very accurate. And this, the Sumeri line has like a very artistic feel to it. It has like a vintage feel to it. Um, and so it's, uh, it's very, it's a very uh, distinct departure from what Canon is normally known for. Um, uh, but as far as uncoded, no, we don't have an uncoded lens per se. I am going to put up a, uh, a slide that has links to some demo footage so you can get a chance to see some stuff that other people have shot. But I think the best uh, solution would be anyone that's interested, we can set up um, a demo of the lenses and, it, and you can see for yourself. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Are there any other questions um, from the dynamic team or uh, uh, thank you for sharing that. We've got some, uh, some links too. And I think Anna um, will be following up and being able to provide these links um, on our website and Facebook page and things. So um, you can, you can get to these as well. Um, if you uh, don't copy them here, we'll be able to find a way to get them out to the audience, but um, any questions on the uh, the dynamic side uh, before we wrap this up? Awesome. Well, 
Thank you so much, Cannon, for, for your time. Um, definitely a, a, an interesting conversation, learning about your products and um, everything that you guys have to offer. And, you know, again, we, we feel lucky and feel grateful to be in this opportunity to be able to have these conversations with manufacturers, learn more about their products and really be a, a distributor for the rest of the rental community and, and a, a, a backup for those who want to try the product, who want to learn more about it and, and uh, get that information and, and equipment into their hands. So um, we appreciate the conversation. I'm sure our audience appreciates it as well. Um, and we definitely look forward to having another event with you guys, hopefully soon. And um, I just wanted to quickly say that let's uh, consider today uh, kind of the appetizer. And obviously, if there's other questions or other necessity to look at equipment, um, we have monitors, we have lenses, we have cameras during the stay at home time that we can arrange uh, to send out. So please reach out if you have people that are interested in looking. Definitely. We definitely will. All right. After that appetizer, I'm hungry for lunch. It's 1220. Um, so thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for the Canon team and, and looking forward to connecting with you guys again. Thanks so much. Thank you guys All so right. much. All right. we hope